Okay, we're clearly in the midst of a historic recession. Unemployment in the United States has reached 33 million people, a real unemployment rate of 20.6%. That's the worst it's been since 1934, which of course was during the Great Depression. So maybe now is a good time to talk about the Great Depression just to realize how historic this current moment is. Just as a recap, the Great Depression started in 1929, following a stock market crash that erased about 50% of the value of the New York Stock Exchange over a three-month period. The stock market had ballooned from speculation over the previous decade, but the bubble burst. Panic set in and people rushed the banks. The banks needed money, so they sold their assets for way under value, ultimately dooming many banks. All the while, farmers are having a bad time, not getting good crops, so they default on their loans and get kicked out. People stop buying things and work dries up. Eventually, the stock market loses nearly 90% of its 1929 value, and unemployment across America is about what it is now but it lasts for years. It can be hard to fathom 1 million families losing their farms or 9 million bank accounts being wiped out. But that's where archeology span comes in because it makes these stories personal. Now, interestingly, if you search for information on the archeology span of the Great Depression, you'll find plenty about archeology span during the Great Depression, but almost nothing about the Great Depression itself. It turns out that along with massive infrastructure, government buildings, and commissioned artwork, the New Deal funded many archeological projects, mostly just to give people a job, just gave people shovels. Anyway, modern archeologists point to the New Deal as a major development in the history of American archeology. span There's even been meta archeological projects where like go find like the New Deal excavations and then excavate the excavations. So like archeology span of archeology. span but when it comes to the archaeology of the Great Depression, about what people's lives were like during the 1930s, there's not a whole lot out there. And there could be a couple reasons for why that is. First, it happened 90 years ago. So is that old enough for archaeology? Now I'd say it is, because by my definition, anything that's left in the ground at any point in time has entered the archaeological record, but I don't know. Maybe. Second, we already know a whole lot about the Great Depression because there are photographs and movies and historical records from the time. You can even go out to people who are alive today and ask them what the Great Depression uh, is like because they're, they're still kicking it. That's true, and at a large scale, we know a whole lot about the Great Depression. But when you bring things down to the individual level, I'd say that there's still a whole lot for us to learn. What about people who didn't leave journals behind or didn't just happen to cross paths with Dorothea Lang? Finally, how much do we care about the Great Depression? Its archaeology isn't nearly as inviting as anything prehistoric, nor is it as flashy as anything from the Gilded Age. Instead, it's mostly the remains of old ranches and piles of tin cans. Regardless of the lack of literature on this subject, and by the way, please let me know in the comments if you're aware of more, here's some examples of how the Great Depression can be seen by what's been left in the ground. The first study by Cordova and Porter is on the Dust Bowl. In the 1930s, during the middle of the Great Depression, a drought hit the American High Plains centered on southeastern Colorado, southwestern Texas, and the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas. It got so dry that farmland soil turned to dust, destroying crops and creating these massive dust storms that blotted out the sun. You know that scene in The Mummy where Imhotep becomes a sandstorm and then he almost like swallows Brendan Fraser in the airplane? It's like that. People's houses were literally buried by dust, their farms were destroyed, and they had to make the difficult decision to pack up their belongings and look for a new life out west. But what this study shows that when viewed from the perspective of geoarchaeology, my favorite of the archaeologies, the Dust Bowl doesn't really stand out a whole lot. The first thing to consider is that the drought that caused the Dust Bowl was bad, but it wasn't bad enough to be considered a mega drought, which have happened several times in that area over the past millennium. Additionally, there's a drought that was just as bad only 20 years later during the 1950s. So then why is the Dust Bowl famous? Well, it seems the effects of the drought were exacerbated by deep tilling farming, which destroyed the native soil and made it so that when things got dry, the ground was so disturbed it simply turned to dust. What Cordova and Porter show is that the effects of the Dust Bowl aren't particularly obvious in the ground. You might expect that such a big environmental catastrophe would be apparent in the dune fields and riverbeds of western Oklahoma. But the authors show that the impact was subtle. The takeaway is that human environmental relations are complicated. 
and it's almost always a combination of factors as to why things went wrong. If it was just a drought alone, the Dust Bowl wouldn't have stood out in history. But it was also a story of unsustainable farming practices. And in the background of all of this, you've got the greatest economic collapse of the 20th century, so the farmers can't get much help from anybody. Moving now to Finger Lakes National Forest in central New York, a study by Wurst and Radarsky shows that the accomplishments of the New Deal weren't always perfect. And if you don't like the government, you're going to love this one. During the Great Depression, there was a New Deal program called the Resettlement Administration, which aimed to save farms and families stranded on submarginal land and end the quote-unquote disastrous wastage of people and natural resources. So basically, identify areas that aren't good for farming and then pay the farmers to just go try somewhere else. The problem is that the administration didn't always get it right. Worst and Radarsky showed that some of the farms identified as being submarginal were actually doing just fine. The archaeological remains of these farmhouses show many improvements, sometimes with expensive materials, and artifacts include fine ceramics such as a porcelain oyster plate. Headlamps, spark plugs, and a carburetor cap indicate families had enough money for cars, and Kodak bottles suggest the living comfortable enough for amateur photography. Finally, soils in relocated farms don't appear to be that different from anywhere else in the region, except for the fact that relocated farm soil tended to be on higher slopes. It turns out that the survey done in the 30s was done by a soil scientist who just drove around the area at about 20 miles an hour, taking notes of what he saw. The authors point out that there's a lot of reverence for the New Deal, but this evidence shows that its results weren't always perfect. I personally have a lot of admiration for the New Deal, but I do appreciate this down-to-earth take on government efficacy. The last example comes from observations I've made doing archaeology in Antelope Valley, California. If you walk around the deserts of California, you're guaranteed to eventually find these random concentrations of tin cans just in the middle of nowhere. At the time, they just seemed like cans, but if you give it a little more thought about what they represent, it becomes a lot more interesting. Despite putting on a good show in the 1932 Olympics, Los Angeles was hit just as bad by the Great Depression as anywhere else. Norris notes that at this time, land was taken up near many desert springs by those who preferred beans and jackrabbit meat to the soup line existence waiting for them in the cities. The takeaway from this is that people were going off the grid during the Great Depression just trying to make ends meet in the middle of the desert. Can you imagine how bad things must have been for people who have just said, all right, I'm going to go camping indefinitely in the desert because it's better than what I have now in L.A.? Actually, the rent prices are pretty bad right now. Honey, do you want to go camping? Now, most of the can scatters that I encountered in Antelope Valley date to the first half of the 20th century, but it's difficult to get them to a specific decade. Given the historical accounts of people going off into the desert during the Great Depression, and these can scatters from people living out there for some extended period of time makes me think that at least some of them represent Great Depression encampments. So Great Depression archaeology shows us a natural disaster that was made worse by human events, a less than perfect government response during the New Deal, and finally desert encampments from people just trying to go out and make ends meet uh, during the midst of a terrible economic tragedy. But there's a whole lot more to the Great Depression than that. And I think archaeology has a whole lot of catching up to do. I'd say give it another 50 years or so. Let's hope things never quite get like that again, and I hope you're doing okay right now. Thank you for watching, and of course subscribe for more Poopy Archaeology.